So we're in 1 Thessalonians 5, that last uh, chapter, and I was going to jump down to uh, verse 8, but I also want to kick back to the the end of chapter 4 for maybe one one last go at those verses. Verse 17, if you're on 5, it might be on the preceding page. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, all that's real good. Amen? I mean, that's good stuff happening right there. We who are alive and remaining is what God is saying. This is, you know, hey, they're going to be caught up in the clouds. That's, this verse is where we get rapturos, which is a Latin word we get, Latin, we get rapture from. But note the last sentence of that verse. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. See, we're not just going up there and, you know, doing like the blue angels or, you know, no, 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 no. He's gone to prepare a place for us. And the interesting thing is, it took him six days to build the whole earth and cosmos and all that. He's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. It's going to be quite the place, isn't it? Because Jesus told us in John 14, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I'm coming back for you. Mm -mm -mm. And so right after that sentence, and thus we shall always be with the Lord, verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. It doesn't say get comfort from somebody with these words. That's always nice. But it's amazing. You know, encouragement, is, it's like uh, C.S. Lewis said the same thing about comfort. It, comfort and encouragement are things that you can't necessarily get by seeking them. Because you can seek encouragement and might not get it. But if you give encouragement... Have you noticed what happens every time? Every time you go to give somebody some encouragement, every time you give courage to somebody, you receive courage from the Lord. Amen? You build somebody up. After you build somebody up, you feel built up. God created us like that. So therefore, comfort one another with these words. And next time somebody goes, you know, my whatever hurts. My shoulder hurts. My hand hurts. My knee hurts. My foot hurts. My my chest hurts. My back hurts. This is not my list. (laughs) But, you know, say, you know what, man? One day you won't have to ache anymore, praise God. Because we're going to be with the Lord, and we shall always be with the Lord. Amen? Because the Bible says there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying. Sweet, sweet. And then again, in First Thessalonians again, big hunk of encouragement. When you go down to chapter 5, and verse 11, we're going to open up 9 here in a moment, but. Well, let's read verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to that. But look at this. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep. Now, let's be a little more plain spoken here. Whether we live or die, whether we're awake, we're alive, whether we're asleep, that's uh, sometimes used to picture death, to symbolize death. So, who died for us that whether we are alive or dead, 
we should live together with him. They may think, wait, wait a minute, Pastor, you just said whether we live or die, we'll live together with him. Didn't you just slip up? No, absolutely not. It is appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. And if you're a born-again Christian, that judgment says, okay, you're with Jesus. You have eternal life. And death is not an eternal thing. It's a doorway. That's what the Bible paints. Now, we don't teach soul sleep. That's a whole other theology that doesn't hold up to some verses and whatnot. But, but look at this verse 10. Who died for us that whether we live or die, we should live together with him. And here it is again. Verse 11. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you are also, just as you also are doing. So again, whether we live or die, we should live for God. And then we saw over here, we will always be with the Lord. So those are things that we comfort each other with, that we edify one another with. It's encouraging. Now, In verse 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and just as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, we have spoken about you know, being sober is a good thing, and certainly the Bible encourages that, and yet this sober is so much more. It is that, you know, being aware of your surroundings, not being wiped out, but it's much more than that. Because, well, let's, let's look at verse 8 again and notice. But let us who are of the day be sober. Notice what we're doing. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So we're putting on armaments. We're putting on a breastplate that covers the chest. So arrows will hopefully bounce off. And the helmet, which is the hope of salvation. Of course, the helmet guards the brain, guards the thinking. And likewise, the hope of salvation guards the thinking. So it's a military thing. Falling asleep at your post while you're supposed to be on watch in the military is usually a capital offense, meaning you can be executed for that, especially in times of war. They, you often don't go to court if you fall asleep on your post during times of war because it will mean the lives of everybody there. And so it's dealt with very, very harshly. And so if, if you want to look at it theologically, you know, the, the enemy still has influence and control here. He's like a, a renter, if you will. He doesn't have the deed. Jesus got that back at the cross. But obviously, the enemy, well, as Hal Lindsey said years ago, is alive and well on planet Earth. So things are happening. But we read in the book of Revelation that there's coming a day. And God's going to pull his chain, amen? Praise God. So let's be aware that, you know, it's that kind of serious, don't, don't fall asleep in your faith, so to speak. Now, 
there's also something big here in verse 8 again. Three important words that have been throughout this first book of Thessalonians and other places in the Bible. But those three words are faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope, or faith, hope, and love. You want to put them in a different order. But those are three very important words. But let us who are the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, again, these three terms have been mentioned several times in this book, including in in the third verse, right off the bat. We'll, We'll bring it up, but you can also just turn right back to verse 3 in the first chapter of the, you know, in in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. See, for context, you almost always have to jump a verse or two. And, And please remember what I've said often. If you're trying to get meaning out of a verse, especially if it's, you know, pretty substantial theological meaning from a verse, Read the 20 verses before it. Read the 20 verses after it. Because that will make sure you're reading the verse in context. Because sometimes that is so, so vitally important. So verse 2 there, first, uh, first chapter, says, We give thanks to God always for you all. Hmm. We should be thankful for one another making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Now, do you think they ever had any problems there? Yep, I'm sure. And yet, Paul says, well, I'm remembering how you messed up. Oh, I'm remembering what you did that one time. Oh, I'm remembering when you first got there, what a mess you were. I'm remembering, no, 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 no. He's remembering their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. Now, if we turn back to chapter five, those three words are again in this verse eight. They're used differently, but again, the phrases are work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. These three concepts are very important for us to understand. These words, what they mean, how they apply to us. And so the work of faith, faith here, understand, faith as a saving faith is faith in God that Jesus died for my sins. Now, I would encourage you either to, to jot that down or um, to come back afterwards when we get it online and, and write it down. The reason is these are very important theological points that when you're talking to somebody that's either an unbeliever or, you know, uh, an unbeliever that goes to church, which is sometimes hard to witness to, um, These are things that you can say, things you can quote. So, you know, the Bible doesn't say, well, as long as you have faith in anything, it's okay. Or some people go, I've heard that, you know, it's like, well, you know, do you think that's right? Well, you know, as long as you're sincere, that's the bar, as long as you're sincere. Adolf Hitler was sincere. He was wrong, but he was sincere. You know, if I, if I leave here and I'm heading north and I'm wanting to go to L.A., I'm really sincerely wanting to go to Los Angeles, but I start heading north, I'm not going to Los Angeles. You, somebody may be sincere about the path, but if, if they're not open to their path may not be the one, and be careful, when we, you know, sometimes when we pray, we work everything out for God. Well, God, you know, do like this and has them, you know, their salvation. They can visit the church and then they come one Sunday and then they get saved and we go out for lunch and, you know, 
And the next thing you hear, they're getting thrown in jail. You go, God, that's, that's not my plan. <laughs> God says, yeah, but I got to get their attention. Do you want your plan or God's plan? Mm. So work of faith. Faith as a saving faith is faith in God that Jesus died for my sins. Not just faith in anything. Now faith looks back. And I, I like what John Calvin wrote. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. Say that one again. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. Meaning there's going to be faith, there's going to be hope, there's going to be love. John Calvin wrote, faith looks to the past when we accepted the Lord, when we were born again. Faith looks to the cross and answered prayer. Do you ever write down when God answers a prayer? You really should. And that's coming from somebody that does it journal. Well, actually, I was talking to somebody about that this week. But let me encourage you, when God answers a prayer, write it down. Write it in your Bible. Write it in the back. And then on tough days, go back there and look at them. And remember. It will build your faith. Now, this other phrase, labor of love. You know, Bible's real plain spoken that We're supposed to have a labor of love for one another. So we should have love for one another or those around us without which love we cannot claim we know God. The Bible makes that point that if you say you know God, you need to love the people around you because either you love God and know God, and love the people around you, or you do not love the people around you, and you do not know God. That's what First John says. Now, everybody can have a bad day, okay? We're not talking about you know, getting upset, with, but I mean just a constant, uncaring, apathy, is a good word, not caring, Somebody's in the midst of a, a battle or a, something hard. So we should have love for one another or though, for those around us, without which love we cannot claim we know God. Love is for the present. So we should have love for God and love for man. And since Jesus said all the law and the prophets hang on those two commands. Let me read that again. Speaking of labor, love, we should have love for one another or those around us without which love we cannot claim. We know God. Love is for the present. So we should have love for God and love for man since Jesus said all the law and prophets hang on those two commands. The third one is patience of hope. Now this is, I don't want to say it's more important than the other two because love obviously is the, most important thing, that's what it reads in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. But we, biblical hope is not the same word that is used out in public when they use the word hope. Out in public or around the world, hope is, gee, I hope it works out. Well, I'm hoping for the best. Which means... Sometimes you're not doing anything <laughs> to, to make it better. But, you know, then we, if we understand hope, biblical hope, whew, that's a different thing. In other words, there is a point in time in our future where what I just read this morning, that Jesus is going to part the clouds and he's going to, Bring us up. That's what the text says. And it could happen any day, any moment. So we know we're coming to that point. We're just not sure what that day or date is. And, you know, anybody that says they do know the date is not, not, 
telling you the truth. You know I mean, it says, you know, no man knows the day or the hour. It was so weird. I think it was back in 88, some guy wrote, uh, 88 Reasons Why God is Coming in 88. And, and he sold like a million books. And then when Jesus didn't come in 88, he wrote a new book, Why Jesus, 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 89, and sold half a million books. I thought, who, I, okay, I understand the first year selling them, but who bought the second year? <sighs> yeah. Now, um, this hope, patience of hope. The hope here is a certainty, it is a known certain event, like the return of Jesus, that gives hope. Not a hope that it may occur. The hope of salvation, the blessed hope, is another way it's phrased in the Bible. The hope of salvation, the blessed hope, looks to the return of Jesus with certainty to the future. In other words, Well, to put it simply, when we sing soon and very soon, we're going to see the king, we believe that. Amen? And every day that we live brings us one day closer to that day. There's a clock in Germany that said, uh, one of these hours, Jesus is returning. The clock in a chapel, really neat, really neat. Titus 2.13 is the one that uses the blessed hope. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I mentioned that faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone, meaning it should be not just faith, but also some fruit, some love, some joy, some peace, servant's heart. And Jesus himself came Not to be served, but to serve. Hmm. Another neat saying, I'm not sure who who penned this one, but the grace that does not change your life will not save your soul. I'm pretty sure that's Spurgeon. The grace that does not change your life will not save your soul. Now, we mention these things because sometimes you'll run into somebody and say, oh, yeah, I prayed that prayer. Oh, great. Pray good church. I don't go to church. Well, do you help out the, the church? Well, no, nah, because, you know, I don't go. What do you give to ministries or anything? Ah, nah, man, they're, they're all about the money. <laughs> nah, they ain't getting none of mine. <laughs> so they're greedy while he... Anyway. So we need to, in, in those instances, say, hey, you know, Look, there's more to walking with God than you're experiencing. You're not experiencing the fullness of what the Lord has for you. If you just prayed a prayer and then didn't change, didn't listen to God, didn't you know, invite the Holy Spirit in, didn't start reading the Bible. See, all those things help us to hear from God. What you're doing right now, hearing a Bible teacher teach and also you reading the Bible. Incidentally, that brings up an interesting uh, dynamic here. Um, Many folks, when they first get here, may have not been taught. They may have been in church, but may have not been taught the Bible. So you are here week after week, and you're getting the Bible, and you're learning the Bible, and you're learning it more and more. And after a few years, it seems like you're getting more in your personal Bible study time than perhaps you are on one service or two. And then you, you notice, well, you, you know, if you sit for an hour with your Bible, well, you get all kinds of stuff. And, you know, and, and sometimes you get something in here and, and, you know, always get a little bit. But it seems like you're getting more and more from your personal devotions. That's what God wants. Amen? Now, the Lord brought the pastors and teachers you know, together. He's the one that gifts the church with those. And, 
It's a very necessary thing. But for you to grow as a believer, you got to be in this word every day. Amen? Now, those three, faith, love, and hope, form a, a whole pattern, if you will. The work of faith looks to the past. The labor of love looks to the present. And the patience of hope looks to the future. Now, that, that's challenging, and I understand that. The work of faith, sometimes maybe you're, you're struggling with doubts. Maybe the, maybe the enemy's hitting you with doubts. Maybe you did a silly thing and watched the History Channel for two days straight or the Discovery Channel for a week. And those things are not always accurate, okay? Sometimes they're highly inaccurate. Just be aware of that. Now, here comes an important one for us to understand. Verse 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that initial looks like, well, God doesn't want to be angry with us, but we get salvation. No, 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 it's much more than that. And I've described it some, but I came across uh, what J. Vernon McGee said, and uh, who I'm related to, even if I've got to go back to Adam. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a little closer now, but he gave just such a great summary. But I thought I'd just read it. It's just a few sentences. It reads this. God hasn't appointed us to the day of wrath, the great tribulation. It is a time of judgment, and the church is not going through it because Christ bore our judgment. Perhaps you were saying, McGee, that's weird. McGee, do you think you were good enough to be taken out in the rapture? No, I'm not even good enough to be saved. But God saved me by his grace, and when he comes to take his church out of this world, I'm going along with all the super-duper saints because of the grace of God. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. See, God has not destined us for wrath, for the great tribulation, but for the salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's, that's good news. That's, that's comforting. See, if I'm up here going, well, you, you know, you're going to go through three and a half years of the tribulation, which is called the worst time that the world has ever seen. Or you're going to go through seven years. And then the rapture. That's not going to comfort you, probably. But if I tell you and explain to you what this wrath concept is, and that God's wrath was poured out for us on Jesus, you see, if he poured out wrath on born-again Christians, it would mean the sacrifice of Jesus wasn't complete. It wasn't enough. That's simply not true. It was enough. His sacrifice is enough to cover any and all sins. And sometimes I think we put ourselves through the tribulation because we, you know, we know we haven't earned the rapture. Well, we don't earn the rapture any more than we earn our salvation, any more than we earn the Holy Spirit. It's by grace we're saved, grace we receive the Holy Spirit, and grace that God is Return them. Amen? Now, again, noticing this military garb, the breastplate and the helmet in this section, and then it, it talks about sleeping. And, and so, next life lesson is, we're told of battle armor and then given battle orders or command events for the battle in the Bible. This, this, when I started reading this next section, it, it just is, it's almost like there's a, a spiritual military commander walking through the troops and, you know, rejoice always, you know, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, you know. And, and so we, we should treat those as such and also treat them that they're not suggestions. Imagine if we were standing in a military group and there was a commander sitting there 
standing there saying these orders. He wouldn't be going, well, I'll think about rejoicing always. No, 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 no. Rejoice always. Yes, sir. Pray without ceasing. Yes, sir. Everything give thanks. Yes, sir. And I mentioned the sleep again. Now when we look at this with military garb and military commands, look at this. In the military, sleeping while on watch is so serious it is punishable by death. Likewise, God's word warns us not to spiritually sleep while on watch for Jesus and while others need the Lord so badly. Read that again. In the military, sleeping while on watch is so serious it is punishable by death. Likewise, God's word warns us not to spiritually sleep while on watch for Jesus and while others need the Lord so badly. And again, the reminder of verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we live or die, we should live together with Christ. Next life lesson is just that verse put into a life lesson. Jesus died for us that whether we are alive or have died, we will live together with Christ. Amen? Now that's not a, you know, well, wait a minute, Pastor, again, you put no, that we die and then the judgment. And then he starts with these uh, commandments, if you will. And what really got me interested in this, and I I think we'll take this again this time and one more time, then we'll be in 2 Thessalonians. So that's like a commitment. But when I went and counted these, there were 22 of them. And I love numbers, and numbers in the Bible do mean something. And there's 22 Hebrew letters. So I found that very fascinating. There's 22 sections of Psalm 119 in the Old Testament because of the 22 letters. So then there's 22 commandments here. And they are to build us up, if you will. And and the first one you hit right there in verse 11, therefore comfort each other. See, that's that's the, there's three, there are two right there. Comfort each other and edify one another. So it's first two commandments. Commandment number one, comfort yourselves together or encourage one another in the faith. So when somebody comes to you and they're beat up or maybe they, you know, they're bothered by some gossip or something, don't go, hey, what gossip? Tell me. You know? No, yeah, pray for them. And like we discussed, you know, when somebody's talking to you and they pause because they're, the Holy Spirit's going, no, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't. And somebody pauses. How often do we have, no, come on, come on, tell me, tell me, tell me. Don't do that. If somebody is pausing, let them pause and let them let go of it. Because they may have been putting something on you, you're going to have a hard time carrying. We talked about the tongue, uh, well, the Word talked about the tongue on Thursday. And, uh, and then we, we looked at that, a lot, of, a lot of encouraging things the tongue can do, and it obviously can do some damage. So then the second commandment here is edify one another, which means to build up one another. And when saying one another, it's saying one another in the flock, in the house of God, in the family of God, if you will. Somebody in the church, but also, you know, look outside the church. But there is a, um, Paul in in one place says, you know, with the fellowship first, make sure the needs of the fellowship are met. And then encourage somebody here, go offer salvation online. So then... We go to verse 12, and it says, We urge you, brethren, that's strong, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So, now here's what's interesting when you start thinking about it. In Thessalonians, that church started. All of them started at the same time. And then Paul said, Uh, you're a pastor, you're an elder, you're an elder, you're a deacon, you're a deacon. And I'm sure he didn't do that solo. He prayed about it and probably talked and he had a, a gift of discernment. Incidentally, discernment is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And 
Conversely, the more you beat it down, when you're convicted, you just keep on, it's going to get weaker. So if something's on television, you know, turn it off. If, if you're in somebody else's house and it's not appropriate for you to grab the remote and turn it off, then just walk out of the room. And if they ask, tell them. Say, I just didn't want that going in my head, man. So they were people that all got saved at the same time were emerged into leadership. And some people were struggling with that. And so Paul speaks to that. But, you know, we all struggle with whoever, whatever spiritual leader is over us, you know, teaching the word, reading the Bible. There's going to come a, a rub. And, and I've noticed something that it's kind of a little strange. But after somebody perhaps comes to me and says, look, I need prayer. I'm struggling with this. And, you know, then God delivers them beautifully and Honestly, I have a hard time remembering exactly what they shared with me because I talked to so many people. And But then they're like, oh, oh, hey, Pastor Dave. Oh, hey, Pastor Dave. I'm like, I don't even remember what you told me. Don't be condemned by it, you know. Yeah. But that can lead to kind of a, a, a friction relationship. And so that third commandment is recognize those who labor among you and are over you and the Lord. So that would be, you know, not only myself, but the other pastors, the elders, and the deacons. And incidentally, uh, when we're praying about somebody even to make them a deacon or to make them an elder, I certainly pray about that, and I'm certainly a part of that. Um, You know, more and more, I'm dependent on the other leaders and talking to them, you know, who's emerging as a deacon and, you know, tell me about him and you know, what deacon seems more, uh, more to be more of an elder. And, uh, but you know, I don't alone say, oh, you're an elder. Oh, you're a deacon. And if somebody says, hey, I think I'm supposed to do this. I, I'm supposed to be an elder. And I go to the guys and they go, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not just going to make that person out. I'm going to go to the guys. And if somebody says, hey, you know, I think God's calling me to go do something else. And, yeah, okay, well, I see some caution areas here. And, you know, I talk to them and see how that goes. If it goes well, then maybe we're involved. If it doesn't go well, we're not going to be involved. And, again, I, I don't do that by myself. I go to the guys and say, do you all see these areas as concern?" Yep. Then he should wait. Yep. He don't want to wait. Yep. We'll pray. Pray for him. So understand it, it is, it's a, uh, while it's senior pastor led, it's still a pluralistic government here. Um, you know, when you start talking about selling the building, it's not like I thought about, okay, let's do this and popped out here. This is something we've been talking about, we've been praying about. And incidentally, the thing that's looking most attractive is perhaps a uh, selling the building and then leasing this sanctuary for a season anyway. So we would sell the building and still be here, which solves a lot of problems. um, So keep us in prayer. We're listening to the Lord. You know, I'm talking to the guys and uh, we're all talking to people who have wisdom in these fields and whatnot. And then the uh, second part of this, look, it says, you know, recognize those who labor among you and are over you and the Lord. And then verse 13 continues, and to esteem them very highly in love. Because they're perfect? No. Because they're like Jesus? Well, they probably are, hopefully, walking towards and becoming more and more like Jesus, but because what the Lord has already done through them. Esteem them very highly in love for their works. Say, the commandment four is, those who labor among you, esteem them very highly in love for their works. Say, now, he immediately tells you what the fruit is from doing that. 
from doing what? Esteeming them highly. Because you, you won't be gossiping with other people and then losing your peace. Which can happen. The Bible says that wisdom from heaven is peaceable. So if somebody shares something with you and you lose your peace, it probably shouldn't have been shared with you, most likely. So you be at peace among yourselves. And that's, again, that's putting an emphatic command. You know, be at peace. And then say, well, if you can work it in. No, be at peace. So that's commandment five. Be at peace among yourselves. And then verse 14, now we exert you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Man, I think it's three in there in the verse 14. So commandment number six is warn the unruly. So if somebody's unruly, what does that mean, unruly? Well, rebellious to the order that God has put in place, either in the church or in the government, and, and make sure that, you know, that you're praying for these leaders. It's easy to critique them. I know that. I understand that. But we are instructed, commanded, to pray for them. Whatever party, whatever job they're doing, pray for them. And I would encourage you to be sure that you're praying for them more than you're talking about them. That's not a very popular stance. I just admit it, but that's a biblical one. And if you find yourself talking about a leader and the Holy Spirit convicts you about it, go ahead and pray for him. Right? Same conversation. So commandment six is warn the unruly. Commandment seven, comfort the faint-hearted. I mean, a lot of people last year or two is <sighs> need comforting. And the, the, you know, whatever comfort the Lord has given you, you can give to the faint-hearted. Good commandment number eight, support the weak. Support the weak. It reminds me of when the guys built the stretcher for their friend that could no longer move, took him to Jesus and when there's a long line, they didn't just go back home. They tore the roof off so they could get him down in there. And I always watch the pronouns when you're reading the Bible. Jesus says, uh, their faith has made you whole. Their faith, because they carried him. It's a great picture of prayer. You carry people in prayer. Commandment yeah. 8. Support the weak. And then it says, you see, this is, you have to have the Holy Spirit to do this. Warn the unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Okay. Uphold the weak. Okay. So, yeah, I think I'm good. God's Holy Spirit can, can help me with all those things. I can do all those things. And then be patient with everybody. Oh, my goodness. Did you have to throw that in there? Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah, he did. That's how we grow, each as individual. If you've lost your patience, you're not walking in the Spirit anymore. Because the fruit of the Spirit is patience. So verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursues what is good, both for yourselves and for all. I think that gives us the next one three. So commandment now is be patient towards all men, all people. And on Ephesians 4, 13, 4, 11 through 13, I alluded to this earlier. It says, and he himself, now it's talking about Jesus. Jesus himself puts in a church one leader? No. no. That's what he does. Now, again, we believe in the senior pastor 
led model, but this says he himself gave some to be apostles. Now, apostles is a funny term. It's just like a spiritual father. It's somebody that can birth people into ministry, seems to have a gift for it. I've seen very few apostles in my life, but I've seen a couple of great ones. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets. Prophets is not only sharing the future, but it's speaking to people on behalf of God. God tells you something, you speak to him. Now, in some Pentecostal circles, that may take the form of, thus saith the Lord, you know, and, and I, I was in a church for uh, a while, and, you know, after worship, there was a time of quiet, and people were encouraged to share if they felt like the Lord was laying a, a word or a, a verse on their, their heart, and, uh, and we encourage that more in our in our life group ministry and going to be encouraged that. Um, and, I, and also, let me share something. How many of you have ever been witnessing and uh, and the people pull out this big can and they say, well, you know, your Christian holidays are, have pagan origins or, or pagan things all involved with them. Anybody ever heard that when you were witnessing this? I'm like, I've heard it a lot. And the reality is, you know, people are assuming uh, Easter and Christmas are biblical holidays. They're biblically based. But they think the tri- the date is arbitrary when it's not. And here's what I mean by that. Next time you're sharing and somebody say that, say, well, you know, uh, Christmas and Easter, yeah, they had some influences, but those aren't the seven biblical holidays. See, the seven biblical holidays are in here, and Jesus actually was crucified on the very day that was Passover. He was resurrected on the very day of first fruits, and then in Acts 2, the very day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit visited. So the holidays, the biblical holidays, don't have any pagan things, and they've been accurate in the prophetic sense. That's a, that's a new answer rather than just going, yeah, there's some weird pagan things in Christmas and Easter. If you're celebrating the incarnation at Christmas, it's a good thing. You're celebrating Jesus became a man. Now, if you're celebrating just the gift given and all that stuff, that's that's not really what Christmas is about, is it? So, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now, some people may walk in the in, in all of those at one time or another, maybe even at one time. It, it's a very rare thing. Um, most people assume a, a pastor is a teacher, but notice here it's two separate things. And it's, what's it for? It's for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for you guys to grow, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Or in the New Living Translation, that verse 14 says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. That's the New Living Translation of Ephesians 4.14. So having these spirit-filled, spirit-gifted offices in the church are are very important. And while I don't claim to walk in all five of those, you know, I, I, I can pretty quickly say, give you names and tell you that all five of those are definitely covered in our church. Amen? Senior pastor shouldn't be the only teacher. Because it, 2 Timothy 2.22 says, raise up other people to teach. 
That's a godly biblical thing to do. I came across something. I'm going to start to close with this. I came across a quote about somebody listening to music. It just was amazing. And I want to share it with you. It says, uh, what was my amazement to discover that I could feel not only the vibrations, but also the impassioned rhythm, the throb and the urge of the music. I could actually distinguish the cornets. It's kind of trumpet. The role of the drums, deep tone violas and violins singing in exquisite unison. The great chorus throbbed against my fingers with poignant pause and flow. Then all the instruments and voices together burst forth an ocean of heavenly vibration and died away like winds when the atom is spent, ending in a delicate shower of sweet notes. I couldn't help remembering that the great composer who poured forth such a flood of sweetness into the world was deaf like myself. I marveled at the power of his quenchless spirit by which out of his pain he wrought such joy for others. Let me thank you warmly for all the delight which your beautiful music has brought to my household and to me with kindest regards and best wishes. I am sincerely yours, Helen Keller. Helen Keller was blind and deaf. How could she describe music like that? They were listening, and a family member suggested that she place her fingers on the speaker diaphragm, which moves with the music. And she was able to feel those vibrations and translate them to the sounds. Now, you've got a, 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 a deaf, uh, blind person here describing music. She's describing Beethoven's Ninth Turto. And one of the things that makes that unique is by that time in his life, Beethoven was completely deaf. So, what I read to you before was a deaf blind person describing music written by a deaf composer, Beethoven, and the person today describing all this to you was born a deaf mute. God is good all the time. Amen. Let's give, let's give me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I choose, you know, I, there's things I could say about my past. And this last year, I've kind of revisited some things and worked through them with the Lord. And man, some of that was, was gut-wrenching. But it, it was good. It was good. It was at the foot of the cross and stuff, you know, the Lord wanted me to, wanted to deal with. And, uh, but I love Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 8. To say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Rock kazak in the Hebrew. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the mute sing. Tongue of the dumb. I like mute. <laughs> For obvious reasons. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. The Calvary Chapel that started here years ago where I got my introduction to Calvary Chapel, they later folded after about seven years. We got up to like 50 people or so. And, uh, and I went on the road sharing and teaching. But the, the name of that church was, uh, the sub name if you will, Desert Streams, Calvary Chapel, Desert Streams. 
And this is this verse I've held so dearly in my life. And so it was the convergence of the, in verse 7, And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. It's interesting when when John had a, a moment, John the Baptist had a moment. Such a man of faith. Baptized Jesus. At the place they crossed over the Jordan and Joshua 1, 2, and 3. It's that same place. Because John the Baptist says God is able to raise up these stones to be sons of Abraham. He was pointing to the 12 stone marker. A man who is a seventh generation Israeli talked about that in Israel when the geography lays out. But think about this. We're talking about a deaf, mute man who both hears and speaks. And Thursday I I sang and played some. And this Bible in a couple places says, you know, the blind seeing, the lame walking, the lepers being healed, the deaf hearing, the mute speaking, the mute singing, the dead raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. It all goes with the sharing of the gospel. Earlier this week, I, uh, well, going back last year, uh, we were so blessed, man. Uh, I reached out to a man I called my pastor for years and years. And then though it was in his 90s, he, he came running, and, uh, and he actually shared here on a Thursday night. It's on the website. And uh, Pastor Pete, but, and, uh, and somebody had prophesied that he would be uh, teaching at 100, and he almost was. Uh, and some now are uh, mistakenly saying uh, that Pete is uh, dead. Let me assure you, after knowing Pete for years and years, Pete Bivak is more alive than he has ever been in his life on this planet Earth right now because he's with Jesus. Amen? Amen. I mean, that's... Mm. Now, see, that's, that's the tearing. See, I, I love the man, and there's, a, you know, kind of an empty spot, if you will, you know, in the, in the phone tree. But, He's with Jesus. He has no more pain. He has no, you know, whatever problems he was dealing with. No, he's with Jesus. And friend, we all get to that point when we let go of everything and we go see Jesus. And that day may be quickly coming upon us. In other words, we won't die, but the rapture will happen. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. I mentioned Thursday that a great way to see evangelism and the way God shared it with me is feeling your heartbeat and realize that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months a year, with every beat of your heart, a lost person is dying without Jesus. And that is death. That's 
physical and spiritual death because there's no more hope. After you take your last breath here, if you've not accepted Jesus, it's, it's done. Think about that and, and start telling more and more people about Jesus. And, and maybe you go, yeah, but I, I get afraid. Well, welcome to the human race. Everybody who goes to witness gets a little anxious before they do, including myself, which is kind of weird because I don't get anxious about coming here out here and teaching a bunch of people. But if it's a one-on-one, I, you know, it's... But, but wait a minute, what do we give in to? Do we give in to the anxiety and say, well, I'm not going to do it? We give in to the fear and say, well, I just can't do that? No, 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 no. That's the final life lesson. In witnessing, let God's love Swallow your fear about sharing. Let me say that again. In witnessing, let God's love swallow your fear about sharing. I ask the worship team to come out. And this is a, it's a neat day for us as a church. It's the first baptism of 2022. It's interesting here. 2020, boy, God sure did sharpen our vision to help us see more than any. And things are happening. Things have been happening. Jesus said, when you see these things start to happen, look up, get ready. Now, how do we get ready? Well, make sure you're an active part of the body of Christ. These commandments I went through, we'll pick up the rest later. Make sure you're walking in those. Those are good biblical instructions that will keep you in peace, keep you in fellowship, keep you in a good place spiritually. Because a lot of people are being challenged. A lot of people are being stretched. So, you know, Pastor Pete went home this week and then Flavius Another fellow dear to us is uh, went home as well this week, and uh, and again, you know, you're 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 sad for the people left behind that will miss them and love them, and but sometimes it just tears me up. But you have to remember, they've gone to their reward. And they would have it no other way. And you know what? Let's go ahead and do it. You know, one day you're going to hear, well, Pastor David McGee, he's, he's dead. No, I won't be. I'll be more alive than I've ever been at that moment. Praise God. Because, see, we're just passing through here. This isn't home. Home is heaven. That's where we're going. So walk in these in the power of God. And if you don't know Jesus... Oh, today could be your day. See, you don't have to do this for six months or study this. or do, No, 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 no. It's as simple as this. Jesus, yes or no? Is Jesus the Messiah, the Savior of the world, come to die for our sins? If that's a yes, ask him to forgive your sins. If you are still rejecting him, you really need to dig into our teachings online and look at the Bible. And if you get questions, we'll be happy to answer them. But don't keep rejecting the Lord and don't just keep seeking. Because Jesus is knocking right now. But if you don't open that door, there will come a day when the knocking stops. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being so patient and so kind with humanity. Lord, the things we look around and see are, Lord, they just turn our stomachs and just grieve us. Lord, if they grieve us, we just can't imagine what it does to your heart. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you that you have a plan to fix all of this. 
Lord, thank you for dying for us, for shedding your blood on a cross that we might be declared righteous, not because of how we live. Our righteousness is as rags, but we get to receive your righteousness. Lord, when we come to you, we can say, Lord, forgive me and please cleanse me of my sins. Wash me even of the desire to commit sin. That's a great prayer for a believer, guys. Lord, that's what we pray for us who already know you. Lord, draw us even closer. If there's something in us holding us back from what's best, Lord, help us to deal with it. In those times when we fall, Lord, thank you that you pick us up and carry us. And Lord, those who don't yet know you, today can say a prayer and with the heart believe And with the mouth, confess that Jesus, you did die on that cross for our sins. You were resurrected on first fruits, the first fruits of resurrection. Lord, just the same way we will be resurrected. Lord, thank you for all those who've already gone before us. Lord, we pray for those who don't yet know you. And our heart cries that they would pray this prayer now. We're going to pray a short, simple prayer. Just asking God to forgive us. If you've already been born again, you can pray it. It's just getting a fresh slate. But if you've never prayed it, please pray it. And let us know. We want to encourage you. And also, again, this is Baptism Sunday. So it's a great day to recommit and be baptized or get saved and be baptized. It's the Bible tells us we believe and say. And we pray. That means we pray out loud. So I'm going to lead you in this prayer and request that you pray after me. This helps you to ask forgiveness from a biblical standpoint. So let's pray together out loud now. Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me so my sins could be forgiven. And I believe you were raised from the dead so I could have a new life and live with you eternally. But I've done things wrong, Lord. And I've not always done the right and loving things. And I am sorry. Please forgive me of all those things. Lord, thank you for dying that I could be forgiven. And thank you for forgiving me. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit to give me the strength to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for those who prayed that prayer, for those who are coming back or coming home, may have wandered off as a prodigal. And we thank you those who just prayed it for the first time. Lord, when one person Ask for forgiveness here. Heaven celebrates. The angels celebrate. So, Lord, we celebrate with you that some have come home and some have received their forgiveness for the first time. Let's give the Lord a hand for what he's doing, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Now we're going to slip into the baptism, and if you've already... Uh, signed up, then you can come forward. I think Jim is going to be coming out. 
And, uh, and before we do that, we're going to worship. And if you've not been baptized, today's your day. If you were sprinkled at birth, the Bible teaches baptism by immersion. And it also teaches believer's baptism, which means if you were baptized as an infant, that wasn't your choice. As an adult, you should make the decision to be baptized. And so that can happen today. So pray for those who are contemplating this now as they make their way there. And just think about what the Lord is speaking to you. Should the Lord bring maybe a face or a name of somebody that needs to hear about the faith, hope, and love that you have that you can share with them? Let's worship the Lord. But still I come because your cross has placed in me my worth. Oh Christ, my King of sympathy, whose wounds secure my Your grace extends to call me friend. Your mercy sets me free. And I know I'm weak. I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name. But because You know, if the Lord is laying something on your heart and you want to come forward, pray. Altar's open. If you've just prayed that prayer for the first time, please either come forward up front or to the tent over there and let us know. And if the Lord's laying on your heart to be baptized, certainly come up and, and let us know. If you want to be baptized but you don't have the clothes for it we can fix that we've got a, a blessing room that has plenty of clothes and uh, we can certainly find a change of clothes for you and let me encourage you, you know to, to as you're watching pray for each person because we recognize from scripture when Jesus came out from his baptism that's when a lot of battles started and when you do something like take a step 
a firm step, a public step, and say, I'm with Jesus and you're baptized. Well, that's the kind of faith that God rewards and the enemy attacks. So God will bless their decision far more than the enemy will attack, but there will be some attacks. So be praying for them. And again, maybe it's your day. Pray about this. If, if maybe, you, again, you were sprinkled and not immersed. Let me encourage you to do it biblically. Jesus came out of the water. That means he was in the water. So we want to do it like Jesus did. Amen. Praise God. All right. Uh, to continue on what Pastor David just mentioned, we want to do what Jesus did. And just so you know, on our last trip to Israel, we did bring back some Jordan River water. And so, like always, we're going to begin by pouring in some of that Jordan River water just to, I don't know, baptize the baptismal, per se. So here we go. All right. So again, just another reminder, if you're thinking about getting baptized, now's your opportunity to go change clothes real quick because we've got a, a stream of folks coming through, so you have a few minutes. And... We're going to do three all at once. Okay. Let's see. We have Sandra Tedder, Carmen Brown, and Tony. Not sure of the last name. Alaskas. All right. <clears throat> I'll just go with Tony for right now. <laughs> all right. So I'll ask each one of you, do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Okay, they all three answered affirmative, so I'll just go with that. Because of the word of your testimony and your faith in Jesus and in obedience to Scripture, we baptize you into the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we go. Woo! <laughs> All right. I think that's our first triple dunk in quite a while. <laughs> I know we've done some double dunks. All right, we have some youth uh, getting ready to come up the stairs and a lot of youth in the attendance here and being here to encourage them, and that's a good thing. All right, a lot of you probably recognize this young lady. Sydney Thoman is coming in to be rebaptized. Being rebaptized is just fine. We're going to do that again today. Sydney, do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Because of the word of your testimony and your faith in Jesus and in obedience to Scripture, we're going to baptize you into the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Comes another young one. All right, here we have Eliza. Eliza, do you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? All right, because of the word of your testimony and your faith in Jesus and in obedience to Scripture, we're going to baptize you in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very cool. Still have a few more. You still have time to make your, your choice, make your decision to come forward as well. It looks like Hope is really excited to be in here. 
I believe we have Helena Brown and Hope Paradis. You young ladies believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because of the word of your testimony and your faith in Jesus and in obedience to Scripture, we baptize you in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Anyone else? Come on, we got everything out just for you. We got the steps wet and everything. We're, we got the mop, we're ready. We got new clothes for you, we're ready. Well, gently used new clothes from the blessing room. Anybody else? <laughs> That's right. All right, well, thanks everyone that uh, came out today, and especially those that uh, stuck around towards the end of the service for the baptism, and those that got, you know, the, the water warmed up for us, the mop bucket out, the towels out for us, laid out the, the pads so we can hopefully walk out of here and on a non-slippery surface. Can we all give the Lord a hand for uh, the baptisms this, today? All right, I think we're going to turn it back over to Pastor David to close us. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I was just remarking how healthy the uh, people in the pool looked. You know, those are, they, they notice they have some wisdom up on top, but they're popped. So praise God. Serving God is a healthy thing, amen? Lives changed for eternity. That's what we're about. That's what we saw again today. Be grateful for each and every life that you just saw. And realize there's some places that baptize a couple of people a year. God is doing something special here. Started something special, still something special. Because God is a special God. And he loves you so much. And he wants to keep you through whatever storms are coming. You just come to him, run to him, especially when you're overwhelmed, and you'll be okay. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine on you. May his grace and mercy surround you, and may he lift you up so you can see the smile on his face. Mm. May you know his shalom, his peace, his healing, his forgiveness, his mercy. His provision, his peace, his shalom, and Hashem Yeshua, the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen.